Anyway, um, the lady on the right-hand side, because I'm alternating, and then you, so. Oh. Um, as we mentioned that uh, the cancer cells... Okay, here you are, sorry. The lights are uh, on my face. Cancer cells uh, negate the three principles of life, and given that cancer cells, to a certain extent, are immortal, or they try to bypass all the mechanism that life prevents to direct them. Is there something to be learned from cancer cells as a mechanism to actually treat and, or as a mechanism for longevity itself, just like viruses have been used to treat certain diseases? Is there something to be learned from cancer? Well, there's, lots, there's, there's lots and lots of things to be learned from cancer in terms of longevity, metabolism, and, uh, and, and we're still learning. Uh, migration, uh, uh, you know, how to build an organ, um, cancers, um, the relationship between stem cell biology, which is a reju rejuvenative medicine, and cancer is very, very close. Um, often the genes that control um, stem cell biology and the capacity to rejuvenate and keep rejuvenating are genes that have originally been described in cancer. Um, and they're either mutated or somehow altered in, in, um, in, in cancer cells. So there's, there's an enormous wealth of literature already there, but much, much more to be learned about how we could use under our understanding of cancer cells potentially to alter metabolism, to alter uh, longevity, and so forth. Great. Okay. Well, the gentleman on the aisle, and then let's go to the back there. There's two at the back. Just shout. Just so that everyone... It's yeah, working. It works. Uh, two questions, really. So I'll start with the trivial one. Did you ask the management to get your coffee table with a double helix under it? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> no, the, the answer is it just came naturally. It's actually not a double helix, I think. It's a... No, uh, uh, under the coffee table. Yes, I, I see under the coffee table. It's a single helix. Uh, oh, but it's... nonetheless. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I did that. No. <laughs> uh, the second one is about really about, and you've tackled it in the gene as well, uh, the why versus how. So over decades and centuries of research and by people like you and academicians and clinicians, we've been able to understand a lot of how things have happened, how evolution has shaped us the way we are. Uh, but why did it happen? I know it, there's really no answer to that question, but every time I speak with my mom, who's based out of Delhi, and She's read all your books, and it, she says it's all because of God. And then she understands she's, she's a scientific person, but she says, how did it begin, like the first two blobs of RNA, why did they get together? Because there's really no argument that I have when she says it's just something that is a divine intervention. Okay. So remember short sentences that end with but, and <laughs> why, why? Why did life fail? Why, well, why so did... so the, 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 the quick answer is, is biologists, and I, I would suspect scientists in general, have no mechanisms to answer why questions. Um, we have mechanisms to answer how questions. Uh, why questions, sometimes physicists can answer based on energetics and the laws of energetics, which thermodynamics, basically. Um, biologists have a very limited toolkit to answer why questions, aside from evolution and you know, those fundamental theories. So um, it's, it, it, asking a, a biologist a, a why question, you'll almost always end up with a how answer. Um, and uh, that's just the way that, that, that science works. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, think that the, I think that looking at energetics and looking at the physics of, of energy, which are sort of uh, you know, non-transferable, immutable laws of the universe, sometimes can be useful. Yes, they can be, yeah, for, 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 for why questions. For, what, for, for, for biological questions. And, 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 and therefore, by extension, for biological questions. But in general, if you, as I said, if you ask a biologist a why question, you'll end up with a how answer. Yeah. And also, sometimes you end up with... Uh, answers which are not that interesting, because what you actually want to... I'm not interested in what a cell is, I'm interested in what a cell does, because the, the, we, 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 we sometimes define things and so sort of with, with taxonomic... Yeah, and it's, like, a, it's an ontological question yeah, rather than, a, exactly. rather than a, yeah. a mechanistic question. Okay, so uh, you, you've just put your hand up, but there are two more before the lady on the fourth row, and they've come in thick and fast. Okay, wait your turn. Yes? Uh, sometimes cells are described as precancerous. 
and they revert to normal in, in due course. I don't know whether this is a shorthand that means something else, but why would those cells uh, do that, and are they predisposed towards normality or towards division? So the quick answer is we don't know, but, I, I, but, but the phenomenon is correct. So, so there, there are cancers that don't become cancers. Um, if you do autopsies on, for instance, uh, this big famous study, autopsies on random uh, victims of car accidents, uh, women, um, and it's a relatively random sample, you find that there are tumors in their breast which um, seem to have done nothing. Um, and often they're old enough that they would have become breast cancer by that time. These are all hypotheses. This is not a real randomized experiment. But, um, but it seems that cancers don't, we're now realizing, and there's a lot about this in, in, in the book, we're now realizing that to become a cancer, you, it, having the mutated genes is not enough. You need to have uh, more than, that, than the mutated genes. You need to co-opt metabolism in certain ways. You need to be in a certain place. You need to create a home for yourself. You need to draw out blood vessels and so forth. There's a whole process. Um, and that process is not only the mutation of genes. And so you can find things that look like cancer and, in fact, may even have the set of mutated genes, but they, aren't, they don't behave like cancers because they don't have the invasive properties that cancers have. One of the things that's changed in cancer biology recently in the last few years is that we used to think of cancers as just being these sort of homogenous masses. Yes. And whereas we are very heavily differentiated tissue with different types in, in our skin and layers and, you know, eye cells are different from muscle cells and so on. And now what we're discovering is that cancers are much more sophisticated. They're not just lumps. They have their own tissue types. That's right. And, that's within correct. them. So can, where, where, how... how I think you know, a question a lot of people want to know is, when are we going to find a cure for cancers? Well, so again, the, the, the plural is the important word. Um, when you say plural, it's not, not only cancers, it's a cancers in a single body, um, has different cell types. And one of the theories about why we have different responses to chemotherapy is that you kill the cells that are susceptible to chemo, but the cells that are not susceptible to chemo in that same cancer uh, are not killed. Um, and this is partly why, actually, um, and I've written about this, this is partly why immunological therapy can be very effective, because the immune system doesn't particularly care what mutations you have. Um, the immune system cares about, you know, whether you have or don't have an antigen, whether you have or don't have a protein that's a marker or a flag. Um, and that's one of the advantages of the immune system. It, it, it's, it's indiscriminate in its capacity to kill and therefore has been quite successful in treating some particular cancers. And that's a big sort of growth area for cancer therapy. That's correct, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's keep them coming. We've got time for a few more. So uh, two over this side and then one on the right-hand side there. Hi. Um, in, your, well, in your opinion, what are the most uh, exciting developments or research going on at the moment? Um, I, I couldn't hear the question. What's the, most, the most exciting areas of research? Of research going on right now. Um, I'm particularly, I mean, you know, people have different interests. Um, Adam might have different interests and in, in, in different directions that he would take that question. I'm particularly interested in immunological therapy um, and the variations of immune therapy. Um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that, I mean, again, this might surprise you, but um, recently we've discovered that we can take a, a, a skin cell from your body and make it into an embryonic-like cell. Um, and that skin cell can then give rise to neurons and uh, uh, muscle cells and cartilage, and so they are called induced, induced because they've been induced, pluripotent because they have the potency of making all of these cells um, uh, stem cells, so IPS cells. And, and um, these cells are absolutely fascinating. Um, they can be made into various different cell types. There's some, uh, there's some concern about how to regulate them, but, uh, uh, but they, are, you know, they become essentially embryonic stem cell-like and have, have really infinite potential. Um, so um, I think that's a very, very active area of research. People are trying to make, for instance, um, pancreatic cells that secrete insulin out of these cells out of IPS cells, and you can. Uh, people are trying to make uh, skin cells. Um, you can make um, a, a beating heart cell um, and potentially recreate, if you could have the scaffolding, potentially recreate a beating heart out of a skin cell that used to be perfectly normal skin cell. I think it's a fascinating area of research. 
Yeah, I mean, I, actually, that is the, I would give the same answer. I did my PhD at Great Ormond Street, which is 100 yards from here. And, and what we were looking at was stem cells um, in the eye, so using, using stem cells to create, uh, to repair damaged tissue in the retina. And that's now therapeutically available using exactly the techniques that, that Sid's describing there. So it's you know, incredibly, it's all derived from that work in the 19th century of understanding right. what cells are. And in fact, I, I, I talk a little bit about not iPS cells, but our lab discovered skeletal stem cells. Um, and we, we've been publishing on skeletal stem cells. And um, we just about a couple of months ago, uh, so these cells make bone and cartilage. Uh, and people thought that once bone and cartilage had been formed, um, that, that, that there was, you, were, you were done. Um, we found that, in, at least in adult uh, animals, there remains a population. It, it's a declining population, but there remains a population that continuously can, can give rise to cartilage as you grow along. So for the first time, about a, two months ago, we transplanted cartilage, cartilage stem cells, and made cartilage inside a, a joint. Um, and so obviously there's some very important therapeutic implications for that, particularly for neglected diseases like osteoarthritis, which is uh, neglected partly because it affects women predominantly. Can you fix my knee? Um, I can try to fix my own knee first, but oh, then yeah, fine, I, fine. You, you, you go after. There's a cue. We've got time for two more questions. One on the right-hand side there, and you've got the mic there, so you go first, and then far, far right there. So I guess this question's kind of different. Like, what advice do you have, or like, how do we go from someone like myself, like a medical student with like experience in research, to I guess someone like you, like clinician, researcher, and like all of that? What advice do you have, I guess? Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> um, the first thing to do is buy the book and read it. It's like a guidebook. <laughs> well, I'm very bad at, at advice, so um, I, I try I try not to give advice because uh, I, whenever I give someone advice, it turns out to be extremely <laughs> terrible advice. So um, uh, the, um, I mean, I, uh, of course I've been asked this question many times before, so I have a little bit of a pat answer to this, but, um, but it's not pat because it applies to my own life. Um, I, I think that, um, I think that work-life balance is overrated, um, and I think you, you shouldn't have it. Um, and Which one shouldn't you have? <laughs> the work or the life? Life. Um, uh, so, um, and uh, you know, you, you, I, I think I think life or leisure um, can live very well in the interstices of of work. Um, and there's so much work to do. There's so much to fix, and it seems to be getting worse every day. Um, and so um, I, I realize it's it's a bad answer. It's probably very bad advice. But uh, so don't don't take it. But that's. Um, that's the advice I usually give. Yeah, I'm going to go with very bad advice. <laughs> and, uh, take as much time as you, as you can. Live life to the full. <laughs> I've tried to enjoy my, near my life, so I do as little work as possible. Very bad at it. Uh, on, the, on the right there. And then um, one, what, time for one more after that. Um, <clears throat> as a complete layperson, I was struck by uh, you saying that cells make up the central nervous system. Um, or, or they're part of the nervous system. So... Putting cancer to one side, which is a big statement, um, how much is the cure to, or, or addressing things like motor neuron disease, Parkinson's, ataxia, all, all based in cells rather than any other attack? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the treatments for, the, for disease of the nervous system is still lagging behind uh, by about 10 years, partly because the mechanism of many of these uh, degenerative diseases is not known. Um, one major problem with degenerative diseases, it's a very major problem and perhaps unrecognized, is that in order to regenerate something, you need to start with something to regenerate. And typically, when you have a degenerative disease, and this applies across all degenerative diseases, that cell, which is capable of regeneration, is gone. Um, and you can't bring it back unless you go this iPS cell route. That's really been maybe a potential escape hatch for, for, for a lot of us. So, um, so by the time, clinically speaking, by the time these patients come to our attention, um, they're, the cells that could, we could potentially regenerate using drugs or other, other things are gone. So that leaves us with cellular therapies. Um, and it leaves us with the possibility of 
uh, either transplanting cells from someone else's body or using this escape hatch of, uh, of iPS cells or ES cells from their own body so that they won't get rejected uh, and inject them into, into, um, into those uh, areas. So I think two efforts are very important here. One is to detect early, um, and there are multiple, multiple uh, efforts going on to, to, reject, uh, to detect early. Um, and then the second one is uh, once detected, uh, either find drugs or cellular therapies um, to, to, um, to, uh, to help. Um, I should say that um, early studies um, with uh, these electrodes in Parkinson's disease and in and OCD and others have, have been very promising. So it's possible that you could, you could um, bypass the missing cells or the dysfunctional cells go, uh, as, as we say in biology, downstream of them and activate a circuit that would, would help uh, with, with some of these uh, therapies, but that's still uh, early days. Well, it is all early days because we are still at the beginning of this amazing forefront of where basic science meets therapy. We're out of time. Um, Sid is going to be signing books uh, through the doors as soon as we've finished. Please buy this book. It is a, it's another masterpiece. It's quite annoying that he's managed to knock out three in a row. It's specifically annoying for me, but there it is. But <laughs> well, please, thank you, Adam. And you've been it, it an is amazing. my absolute pleasure. But let me just ask you to put your hands together for Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. Thank you.